Welcome to Psychological Explorations with Dr. Michael Axelman. And Daniela. And John. Today, we're going to be exploring Winnicott's 1947 paper, Hate in the Countertransference. The paper begins with Winnicott reflecting on the challenges of conducting an analysis with psychotic patients. And he, he refers to it kindly by the term ambivalence. And I quote, insane patients must always be a heavy emotional burden on those who care for them. It really has value to the psychiatrists, even to one whose work does not in any way take him into the analytic type relationship to patients. So what we're talking about today really has broad value for not just therapists, but parents, educators, anybody who does close work with children and adults. He identifies ways of classifying countertransference phenomena. So what is taking place between the patient and the therapist and the countertransference is how the therapist is responding at any given moment to the patient. And he talks about abnormality and the countertransference related to repressed feelings and set relations and identifications. Certain aspects of the patient may remind us of somebody who we know well we may have challenges with difficulties and those become part of the identifications in the counter transference the other side of the coin is the positive personality identifications and tendencies which help provide the positive setting and the facilitating environment And then he adds that truly objective countertransference, while the other two are, are subjectively informed. The truly objective countertransference, the analysts love and hate in reaction to the actual personality and behavior of the patient. And he asks us to sort out and study his objective reactions to the patient and these will include hate. So in this relationship, there's a coincidence, okay, a co-occurring of love and hate, giving rise to problems of management, which can easily take the analyst beyond his resources. This coincidence of love and hate to which I am referring implies that in the history of the patient, there was an environmental failure at the time of the first object finding instinctual impulse. So there's an implication that the environmental failure earlier, okay, leads to this coincidence of love and hate showing up in the analytic setting. This objective hate, truly objective hate, is hate that is justified, according to Winnicott. If an, if an analyst is to analyze psychotics or antisocials, he must be able to be so thoroughly aware of the countertransference that he can sort out and study his objective reactions to the patient. Hate that is justified in the present setting has to be sorted out and kept in storage and available for eventual interpretation. 
the analyst needs to be able to hate objectively. Winnicott is giving us permission here to both feel hate and to feel justified in feeling the hate because of how we're being treated in this very specialized setting. Making others hate me for psychological relief. And here the enemy is made external. I quote here uh, where he's talking about a case that he had of a very bad obsessional. It was almost loathsome to me for some years. I felt bad about this until the analysis turned a corner and the patient became lovable. And then I realized that his unlikableness had been an active symptom, unconsciously determined. It was indeed a wonderful day for me and much later on when I could actually tell the patient that I and his friends had been repelled by him, but he had been too ill for us to let him know. What a remarkable thing when that interpretation can be made and received. The objective hate is communicated. A wonderful day. So the hate is expressed in multiple ways. Some of them are direct and some of them are passive that are just built into part of the frame. Right? We can't go home with the patients. We can't go out to restaurants with the patients. We only meet them in our office setting for a set number of times a week for a set amount of time. And by this setup, right, hate is expressed by the existence of the end of the hour. I'm here for you fully during this time. Yes, and that must be accepted. And that does engender hate. The analyst must be prepared to bear the strain without expecting the patient to know anything about what he is doing perhaps over a long period of time. There is a vast difference between those patients who have had satisfactory early experiences, which can be discovered in the transference, and those whose very early experience have been so deficient or distorted that the analyst has to be the first in the patient's life to supply certain environmental essentials. So we're talking about recreating the mother-infant setup in the analytic relationship through the transference, counter-transference, where there can be active hating and where the therapist can experience justified hate. And we talked about survival and their survival of the hate is the key issue, is what it's all about. So in this state in which there wasn't a good enough experience, the impingements were too great, the child adult is left in a state of psychotic uh, confusion and unable to symbolize. Symbolization, the move into abstraction is built upon the attachment and the not good enough attachment leaves one in concrete and superficial functioning. For the neurotic, you know, that's all of us who are listening here. The couch and warmth and comfort can be symbolical of the mother's love. For the psychotic, 
it would be more true to say that these things are the analyst's physical expression of love. The couch is the analyst's lap or womb, and the warmth is the live warmth of the analyst's body. So we're talking about the creation of a very primitive type of relational setting that occurs, and then the redoing of this primary attachment in the analytic setting. If the patient seeks objective or justified hate, he must be able to reach it. Else, he cannot feel he can reach objective love. It seems that he can believe in being loved only after reaching being hated. And this is such a challenge for so many therapists and educators to communicate this particular aspect in the transference, counter-transference, this justified hate. It brings up tremendous guilt for many people and they recoil from the idea of sharing this with a patient. Some find the word hate to be just so strong that they can't even think about uttering this word. They feel that it's too strong and it may be damaging. I have never found this to be my case when sharing this with children. So the particular analytic technique that gets identified by Winnicott is communicating hate and maintaining a low level of reactivity without a change in attitude. The important things is that each time, just as I put him outside the door, I told him something. I told him that what had happened made me hate him. This was easy because it was so true. Winnicott here is referring to a, a case that he actually took into his home for uh, months, three or four months, as a, a special type of therapeutic care. And um, he wrote about this case several times. And um, I think he looks back and sees it as kind of a, a not completely successful treatment. But the important part of the communication, every time that the child went into a destructive way of relating and interacting and needed to be contained, placed outside the door onto the, you know, the step of the front house and was able to come back in when he was ready. Winnicott communicated how much he hated the child when the child did this. I think you can report hate for the situation that the child creates. And if hate's too strong and you need to word it with, I don't like it when you do this, that seems to be, to work as well. As long as there is this direct communication about how the adult is impacted, then it's real. If the adult pretends that it doesn't bother them and that everything's okay and the child's fine, they're just going through a little thing, and the information in the communication isn't fully received. The child stays stuck and just continues hating. When the hate is received and integrated and the child feels understood that the hate is there and the parent is surviving, it brings so much love to the foreground. It's tremendous. The child can really access how much they love the parent and communicate that love directly in words and deeds. So in closing, Winnicott talks about this surviving of ruthless love and communicating the strain, okay, the hate that's experienced. The most remarkable thing about a mother is her ability to be hurt so much by her baby 
and to hate so much without paying the child out and her ability to wait for rewards that may or may not come at a later date. But I believe that an analysis is incomplete if even towards the end, it has not been possible for the analyst to tell the patient what he, the analyst did, unbeknown for the patient whilst he was ill in the early stages. Until this interpretation is made, the patient is kept to some extent in the position of the infant, one who cannot understand what he owes his mother, in the position of object relating. Yeah, into that place where he can't understand perspective. This is the conclusion of the first part of our discussion. We'll take a break at this time and come back for part two, where we discuss personal reflections, case examples, and apply this theory more generally. Thank you. <laughs>